Thank you for weathering the, the storm out there. My name is Michael Mayville with the James from Russell. I'm starting it off, isn't it? <laughs> it's for you, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I'm in the talk right now. Um, so my name is Michael Mayhawk with the James Wilson Institute. If you do have electronic devices like some people do, <laughs> if you could turn them on mute right now, we would greatly appreciate it. Um, welcome to the James Wilson Institute uh, program tonight. Before we get started with our three uh, wonderful speakers and participants, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about the home you're in, since it's a, it's a terrific story, I think. It's uh, originally uh, was built in 1825 during the first year of John Quincy Adams' administration by a man named Tench Ringgold. So this is called originally the Ringgold House. He was the man in charge of repairing the damage that was done to the White House and the, and the Congress, the Capitol building, by the British in the War of 1812. And he had this house built. He was a friend of Justice Chief Justice John Marshall, as well as Story, and both John Marshall and Justice Story rented rooms in this house. So they would have died in that room right there and maybe had some libation, who knows. Uh, 1827 to 1861, a man named William Carroll was the clerk of the Supreme Court, the longest term to be the clerk of the Supreme Court. He purchased this house 1850, and he bought what is now known as the Lincoln Bible, where Chief Justice Taney used that Bible to swear in Abraham Lincoln as president, March 4th, 1861. So this was the man that owned the Bible, that is now the Lincoln Bible, the man that owned this house. President Lincoln was in this room while president to attend the wedding of William Carroll's daughter. So President Lincoln and John Marshall and Justice Story have all been in this room. Sir, would you like to take a seat right there? Okay. When President Lincoln's 12-year-old son, Willie, died from typhoid fever in 1862, he was buried in William Carroll's family tomb at Georgetown Oak Ridge Cemetery. Later on in the 20th century, U.S. Congressman Bacon, famous for the Bacon Davis Bacon Act, and his wife Virginia bought this home. Bacon's father had been Secretary of State to Theodore Roosevelt, as well as Ambassador to France. So Congressman Bacon had a special interest in foreign service, and he served in World War I. In 1950, a small organization called the Association for Diplomatic and Consular uh, officers retired, or DACOR, in effect the Retirement Trade Association for State Department officials, foreign service officers, came to see Mrs. Bacon, her husband was deceased, and uh, asked her if they could rent some office space here. Uh, sorry, 1850 that organization was started, 1950. In 1985, um, she, uh, instead of renting office space to Decor, gave them this home. And so this is the home now of the diplomatic and retired Corps, uh, retired. Among its treasures, and this is the last thing I'll point out, is a desk in the library downstairs when you go down for drinks after the program, you'll see a desk used by Secretary of State John Quincy Adams when he wrote uh, the draft of the Monroe Doctrine for President Monroe to review. Also using that desk was every Secretary of State through 1946. So Henry Clay, Webster, Calhoun, Seward, Fish, Elihu Root, Charles Evans Hughes, Dean Acheson, Cordell Hall, John Foster Dallas all used the desk in the library. You ought to go see it when you're here. With that, I want to introduce uh, Hadley Arcus, who's the director and founder of the James Wilson Institute. Hadley? Thanks for coming out. Uh, the subject is theology. The other day I was moved to uh, call Notre Dame 
from Tom Stoppard's The Invention of Love. And he had the 19 year old A. E. Hausman doing a riff for his sister on God's words to Moses as he was showing him the promised land they would not enter. And he said, I'm giving you all of the land of Gilead unto Dan, all of Naphtali. All of Ephraim and Manasseh, all of Judah to the utmost sea, but not including Wales, which I'm saving for the Methodists. <laughs> <laughs> the redoubtable late Harry Jaffa, in an essay many years ago, imagined the scene of Moses coming down in Sinai, finding his people worshiping golden calf, and being told that since you've been away, we've discovered a natural right to religious freedom. We now can worship to a goat, the golden cow. What Jaffa offered as laughable has now become fully serious and accepted even by certain defenders of religious freedom. One friend of mine, a scholar who works in this vineyard, uh, has remarked that the fundamental human right to religious freedom is grounded in the truth about the human person. It is enjoyed and should be protected whether or not one's religious beliefs are true. Now, with this expansive view of things, we no longer require any plausible defini definition of religion, must have a connection to the G word, God. And the Satanists <coughs> found a new growth industry in doing invocations before legislative assemblies, before their sessions. The affirmation of radical evil no longer counts as a disqualification for what may be considered legitimate as religion under our laws right now. So we may rightly ask, how do we get here? How do we get to this point? James Wilson of Philadelphia, whose name we've taken for our institute, James Wilson, the Scott immigrant, one of the premier minds among the American founders, a leading voice of the Constitutional Convention, a member of the first Supreme Court, the author of a remarkable series of lectures at the law school at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Is this not working? It's a little is this working? Yes. Why do I have that problem? Uh, Wilson said, contrary to Blackstone, that the law in America could indeed incorporate a principle of revolution. For the law in America began with the possibility that there could be an unjust law, a measure passed with all of the trappings of legality but wanting in the very substance of justice. But that implied that we have access to a body of moral principles, apart from the positive law. Principles that would come into play and allow us to gauge the rightness of the justification of what has been enacted in the positive law. Wilson found the surety for those moral truths in two sources. But they were founded in the laws of reason, themselves and things that were true of necessity, and they sprang from the author of the laws of nature and reason that Creator mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. For Wilson and others among the founders, the presence of God marked the inequalities of nature that explained in turn that anchoring premise of the American regime, all men are created equal. And we ran this way. No man is by nature the ruler of other men, the way that God is by nature the ruler of men, and men are by nature the ruler of dogs and horses. And anyone who rejects that, said Jefferson, have to assume that the mass of mankind were born with saddles on their backs, and the privileged few were born with spurs on ready to ride them. And James Wilson put it this way, he said, supreme power would be warranted in the case of him who is supreme. For the rest of us sublunary creatures, um, it's a matter of government by consent. And of course, Wilson would observe later that government was the noblest work of man, but man was the noblest work of God. Lincoln, Lincoln would put it this way he said, Nothing stamped with the divine image and likeness was sent into the world to be trodden on and degraded and imbruted. By its fellows. So what Christianity confirmed was that human beings were rights-bearing beings. And once we have that understanding in place, that sense of things would underlie the claim to all of our natural and constitutional rights, from the ground 
to the prosaic. It would encompass our right not to have our lives taken, our freedom restricted, our property taken <coughs> without justification. So even though, so these, it would encompass these rights, even though the rights in question may not be exactly the right to worship or to hold to our religious views. Uh, years ago, I had a commission to do a, uh, a piece on the new Holocaust Museum. And as I walked through there, I took a turn, probably taken by many people here, when I suddenly came across this vat filled with shoes, the shoes of the victims, as the Nazis sought to retain things they could sell or use again. And what came flashing back at that moment were those searing words of Justice McLean in dissent in the Dred Scott decision, where he leaned in and said, you may think that black man is chattel, but he's a creature made in the image of his maker. He is amenable to the laws of God and man, and he is destined to an endless existence. That is, he has a soul that will not be composed from his material existence. Comes to his man. They used to say you get to measure the situation when you realize the Nazis looked at the same scene. And they thought <coughs> the shoes were the door. And I have many people in the academy with large sympathies, but even they recognize they can't quite give the same account of the wrong of slavery, of the wrong of the Holocaust, that we claim with this religious understanding was able to give. And the curious irony here is the one brought out recently by our friend, the renowned international, expert in international law, Joe Weiler, now in uh, Jerusalem, the box between Harvard and New York. Weiler has resisted the move to purge from the constitutions of Europe any reference to the Christian tradition, not good for the Jews. He said. He's argued that political regimes that are founded on Judeo Christian premises are more likely to protect the rights of religious groups that are not Christian or Jewish. Yet that's not always been. Case. As Mark Paul points out in his book, when the delegates met in Philadelphia in 1787 to draft a new constitution, only Protestants were allowed to hold office in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Georgia, New Jersey, North Carolina, South Carolina, Vermont, Rhode Island. And you may recall that when Washington wrote his famous letter, to the Hebrew congregation in Newport and celebrated the natural right to religious freedom. He's writing at the time when Jews did not yet have the civic rights to hold office or to vote in Rhode Island. Delaware, Maryland, Pennsylvania confined those rights to Christians only, and that was the opening, first to accommodate the variety of Christian denominations and then openness to Jews in New York and Pennsylvania with lingering resistance to those papists. But something was planted in the very premises with the crater who stamped, the crater who stamped us as the bearer of natural rights. And something also worked in the political order itself to remove what minimal establishments there were, whether in Massachusetts or South Carolina, voters simply began to recoil at being taxed to support, say, Trinitarian ministers when the people of the town were turning Unitarian. That was the process of work. Jefferson's metaphor of a wall of separation between church and state became the reigning metaphor after the Supreme Court in 1947 began the move to start pushing religion out of the public square and stamp religion as something divisive and unhealthy in a democracy. But as Mark Hall shows in his new book, that was a thoroughly false account of the American founding, a false account of uh, Jefferson and Madison. Jefferson attended religious services, as you probably know, at the Capitol. He moved, asked Congress to provide funds to support the Catholic priests of the Kaskeski and Indians. There would be a bar to favoring one religious denomination over another, but at no point, at no point, did the founders hold that the Constitution barred the government from favoring religion 
of air religion. My dear friend, Ed Whalen, was clerk to Justice Scalia. During that horrible year of 1991 to 92, which brought us, among other things, apart from Planned Parenthood versus Casey, brought us in the case of Lee versus Weissman, which he has in the book as one of the as a, as a section. The court in that case essentially allowed one atheist parent to bar other parents and children at the high school commencement from hearing from a rabbi the most unsectarian of invocations, and the thanks to the God of the world. Justice Scalia wrote a penetrating and ingenious dissent. But along with everything else, you point out that this mild appeal to religious sentiment with an audience quite diverse was actually an appeal that kind of crossed the divisions by race, ethnicity, even sectarian differences, and reminded people of the fault of religious faith that most of them did share. Religion here, as he argued, was integrated. Not, not divisive. As Mark Hall has observed, the Bible did not provide a manual for the Constitution as a structure of government. And Justice Scalia was inclined to argue that his Catholicism would not affect the main lines of his vocation as a jurist applying the Constitution. But he came to a court quite advanced already in the project of pushing religion out of the public square. And he became a voice for sheltering the religious where he could from that move to create disabilities in the law that were solely un and religious. We have two friends with us today who have reflected for a long while on these matters with two books at hand. Mark Hall is Herbert Hoover, distinguished professor of politics at the faculty, fellow at the William Penn Honors Program at George Fox University. He's also associated with faculty at the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University, senior fellow at Baylor's Institute for Studies of Religion. He took his PhD at the University of Virginia. He's written and edited, co edited about a dozen books on religion and politics in America, among them the new book, Does in America Have a Christian Founding? Great Christian Jurist in American History this year with Cambridge. Good president now, which tells me he's not interested in selling the books as much as having them published. America's Wars, fake, uh, Roger Sherman and the Creation of the American Republic, and the political legal philosophy of James Wilson. Ed Whalen is the president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He directs EPPC's program on the Constitution, the courts, the culture. He did his undergraduate work at Harvard, then Harvard Law School, where he is on the Law Review, graduated Magna, then went on to clerk for our friend Justice Scalia. He served in positions of responsibility of all three branches of the federal government. Just before the terrorist attacks of September 2001, he was in the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice, where Scalia also served. It's a very, very important use for him. In that capacity, Ed advised the White House Counsel's Office, the Attorney General, other senior officials at a very, very portentous time in this, our national life. He previously served Capitol Hill as General Counsel to the U.S. Senate Committee on Judiciary, where he's working with Senator Hatch. In 2004, he became President of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and he brought to that center a new level of visibility, I think, and public engagement. He's cut a notable figure on the bench memos for the National Review Online in tracking the work of the courts and commenting on nominations to the federal courts and any other issue of, of legal law significance coming up. He's been an ally of mine on the move to try to restore the penalties that were stripped away from our Born Alive Infants Protection Act back in 2002. And so he was very kind to work with me and our committee to bring forth that Born Alive Survivors of Abortion Protection Act. Uh, he's the co-editor, along with our friend Chris Scalia, of Scalia Speaks, Reflections on Law, Faith, and Life Well Lived, a New York Times best-selling book, by the way. And now we have On Faith, Lessons from an American Believer. So we have two good friends with important books at hand. Let's begin with Mark. Would you help me in welcoming Mark Hall to the lecture? Thank you very much, Anthony and uh, Michael. It's wonderful to be here. I, I didn't know 
Maui with the Jane Tolson Institute for years, and um, just love the work that's going on there. So, uh, although we have my book, Did America Have a Christian Founding, in part tonight, is about celebrating another book, The Great Christian Jurist in American History, which, as Emily suggested, is published by Cambridge University Press, and so therefore it's priced at about $130 a copy. And so I actually haven't seen a copy, although apparently some people have, but we figured this would not be a good book to bring to sell. We do have on some of your seats, I think every other seat, the um, list of great Christian jurists that we identify. And so you might look at that and it might whet your appetite to um, perhaps ask your university library or local library to buy a copy so you can check it out and read it. Let me say a few words about the project and then I will get into my chapter. Um, actually, not my chapter, but I'll talk about James Wilson and um, how that came to be. So John Woody of Emory University has a, a, has a series, Great Christian Jurist in France, Great Christian Jurist in Scotland, Great Christian Jurist in England. And we were honored that he came to Daniel Drasbach and I and asked us to do the volume for America. And you might think that we have a much easier task than England or France or Germany, say, um, since our history is, is, is much shorter. But it still was pretty daunting. So we had room for maybe 18, 19 jurists, which works out to be roughly for a century, right? So how do you narrow down uh, all, the, all, all, all the fine Christian jurists that exist to get them? Um, let me first of all say by jurists, by Christian, by Christian, uh, we're not necessarily insisting on a, a commitment to the Apostles' Creed or Nicene Creed. So uh, many of our jurists would, of course, be con um, committed to that. But there are others, a, a, a Unitarian Joseph Story, for instance, is widely considered a Christian jurist, an important Christian jurist, and so we did not want to exclude someone like that. As well, I should emphasize, when we say jurist, we do not mean necessarily a judge. So we have um, some people who have never served as judge, so Robert George, for instance. Uh, the way we went about getting the list together is we surveyed 50 academics that we respected on these sorts of questions, and got a bunch of suggestions, but then we had to make very hard choices, and we had to not include people, and some people might be very disappointed in some of the people we included or didn't include. Um, so, for instance, in Clarence Thomas, we were unable to include him. Adley Arcus, I think you can make a very fine argument that he belongs in there as well, but we were unable to include him. But in, hope, in, in part, what we hope is that our project will, will stir additional work on um, these individuals. So, um, ironically, I think it's ironic, um, I have my first book on James Wilson, but I did not get to write the James Wilson chapter. So he had me write another chapter on Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth, sort of a dual um, chapter. Again, I did not write the chapter on Scalia. We had another um, law professor, uh, Thomas Burke, write that chapter. So we're both speaking about justices, or in this case, both justices who made the collection um, but we did not actually write the chapters. But I think I have a thing to say or two about James Wilson. All right, so Wilson, um, I'll give a little bit of biography, then I'll focus in on, on his jurisprudence, and I will not attempt to go through all of the various contributions he made in the American Republic, because I simply do not have the time. Um, one of the more interesting things about Wilson, which many of you all probably know, of course, is that he's born in Scotland to um, what you might call lower middle class farms. Um, fortunately, Scotland, in part because of the, the, the Presbyterian there, had a very robust system of education. So he not only got a basic education in literacy, but he was able to learn some Greek and Latin enough to get uh, a scholarship to go to the University of St. Andrews. Um, we've learned recently, thanks to the detective work of Martin Claggett, that he served as a legal apprentice in Scotland. That was something, if you look at the major biographies uh, prior to Martin Claggett's work, we did not know. Um, and then he also took classes at the University of Glasgow. Most of the other biographers speculate, maybe he did this, but now we know for sure. Um, at the University of Glasgow, we might have heard lectures by Thomas Reed or Adams, which is kind of interesting. Um, he immigrated to America in 1765, taught Greek and Latin at the College of Philadelphia, um, but he was far too ambitious for that. So he apprenticed on the law under John Dickinson and rapidly became one of the most prominent attorneys in America. And throughout his life, he maintained a practice of law. But what I think I want to do is shift to his jurisprudence. One of the great things about Wilson is he gave a series of law lectures at the College of Philadelphia, which we now know as the University of Pennsylvania, from 1790 to 1792. These were a big deal. At the inaugural lecture, let me just um, note who was in attendance. The president with his lady, the vice president, both houses of Congress, the president and both houses of the legislature of Pennsylvania, 
together with another uh, a number of other um, gentlemen and ladies. So this was this was a big deal. I mean, basically, Wilson wanted to become the, the American Blackstone. Um, he did not like Blackstone in many respects. They agreed on some things, but certainly not on others. And he did not like this idea that American attorneys would learn law by reading William Blackstone. And so these lectures are very systematic. Um, and they're very philosophical. They're maybe the closest thing we have to um, something one would recognize as political and legal philosophy um, coming out of the American founding. So uh, I commend them to you if you have not read them. He spends a lot of time on epistemology and morality and, and, and so forth. Um, when you read his sections on morality, you would be excused uh, to, from thinking that you're reading St. Thomas Aquinas. He makes distinctions like this. There are two types of law divine law and human law. There are four types of divine law. Eternal law, celestial law, natural moral laws, and natural physical laws. Human law, he goes on to say, must be based on the natural law, if it is to be valid. He paraphrases St. Augustine, an unjust law is no law at all. Um, he spins out some of the implications of these things um, as he goes through a variety of rights that the American government has a duty to protect in all governments, for that matter, um, but particularly he's thinking at the national level here. Let me just discuss two of them. But again, if we had more time, we could go through a number. Um, one of my favorite is his discussion of the right to life. Wilson argued that because man, fearfully and wonderfully made, is a workmanship of his all-perfect creator, the right to life must always be respected. Um, he wrote with evident approval that from with consistency, beautiful and deviating, human life from its commencement to its close is protected by the common law. In the contemplation of the law, life begins when the infant is first able to stir in the womb. By the law, life is protected not only from immediate destruction, but from every degree of actual violence, and in some cases, every degree of danger. Um, he went on to criticize the ancient societies of Sparta, Athens, China, and Rome for the practicing of killing unborn, uh, unwanted infants. And he went on to condemn the Hindu, the gentle Hindu, he called him, who is laudably averse to the shedding of blood, but who carries his worn out friend and benefactor to perish on the banks of the Ganges. And when he talked about suicide, as, as almost any um, legal thinker would have prior probably to the 20th century, um, he says, of course, there's no right to suicide. It was not by his own voluntary act that man made his appearance upon the theater of life. He cannot therefore plead the right of a nation by his own voluntary act to make his exit. He did not make, therefore he has no right to destroy himself. He alone, whose gift this state of existence is, has the right to say when and how it shall receive termination. Um, when, we, when I mentioned um, life being protected from the womb, Wilson, like um, almost anyone in Sarah, um, believed that life began when, it was, when the infants are first stirred. I am pretty confident that if he had the medical knowledge that we have today, he would say from conception to its natural end, life must be protected. Um, when it comes to liberty, Wilson, like just about everyone in this era, rejected the modern um, individualistic notion of liberty that most Americans have come to embrace since John Stuart Mill. Uh, Barry Allen Shane, in his fine work on, on this era, identifies eight different ways in which liberty was understood, um, particularly interesting for um, with respect to things like freedom of speech and how we might act in public, um, Wilson distinguishes between liberty and licentiousness. Law without liberty is tyranny. Liberty without law is licentiousness. There is no right to do a wrong, and almost every founder would have agreed with this. So if he went up to the founding generation and started talking about a right to publish pornography, they would just, it would be befuddled. They would have no idea what you were talking about. Um, I would like to emphasize that um, Wilson very much em emphasized the importance of religious liberty, so even though he's drawing deeply from his Christian convictions and ideas developed within the Christian tradition of political reflection, he understands that religious liberty is a key principle. Let's see, Wilson, as many of you all know, was influenced by the um, more theistic way of the Scottish Enlightenment by a Thomas Reed, a Dougal Stewart. And so he believed in this thing called a moral sense, and this really combines in an interesting way with his natural law um, commitments. Basically, he says, and he quotes the Apostle Paul in Romans 2, that every individual has access to the natural law. Everyone can know 
right from wrong. It doesn't require an expert. It doesn't require someone with a PhD. And this, I think, helps explain why he is such a radical Democrat, small d Democrat, in the national convention, in the constitutional convention. So Wilson is the only one who argues for the direct popular election of the president, the direct popular election of the members of the House of Representatives, and the direct popular and proportional election of senators, radically democratic um, for the age. Of course, other people argue for the direct popular election of the House, but he's the only one to argue for all of those things. And I'm not saying they're a good idea, but I think it's an interesting working out of his um, combination of the moral sense plus the natural law. Let me, um, let me skip a little bit, I think, to focus in on his work as a justice. Um, one of the things, I was part of a book a few years ago, it's a kind of fun book, that um, we profiled all of the justices um, prior to John Marshall. And I, I, of course, wrote the chapter on James Wilson, we had everyone else profiled. And one of the things that came out in these chapters is every single justice prior to John Marshall, with the exception of James Iredell, is clearly on record, saying that a judge could appropriately strike down an act of Congress or an act of another legislature if it violated the natural law. And that's quite a claim, particularly well before Marbury versus Madison, right? So an act that does not go against the Constitution but natural law. And again, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I, I, I think uh, Robbie George and, uh, and others would agree that even though the natural law exists, it might be problematic to have justices going around acting on it. In part, that's because, um, honestly, I don't trust a number of the justices. Some I could actually trust to do that, but many I would not. Um, let me... Yeah, let me do emphasize that even though he held this view, which might seem quite striking, he was an advocate of judicial restraint. Um, here I want to quote him on judicial review. Laws may be unjust, may be unwise, may be dangerous, may be destructive, and yet not be so unconstitutional as to justify a judge in refusing to give them effect. And um, he said a similar thing with respect to um, the natural law and application of that. All right, within the um, ratification debates, uh, Wilson, of course, uh, critically, critically important to the Constitutional Convention. He then is the only um, delegate to go from the Convention to Pennsylvania, where he plays a, a, a critical role in achieving the ratification of the Constitution of Pennsylvania, the first large state to ratify it. And um, he gives a speech, a state house yard speech, which Bernard Bailey has said, and the context of the time was actually far more important than the Federalist Papers. All right, so Wilson is a Supreme Court Justice. Um, he was served um, until his death in 1798. He wanted to be Chief Justice, but that was not to be. Um, but he served ably as an Associate Justice, even as, I mean, this guy was crazily busy, even as he was giving his lectures on law in Philadelphia, riding circuit, and continuing in his practice of law and investment in Western land, um, which ultimately got him into trouble. One of the more interesting cases that Wilson decided that has been overlooked involved the Invalid Petitioners Act, an act whereby Congress to help compensate soldiers hurt, injured in the, in the War for American Independence, um, basically assigned justices to act in an administrative capacity. Well, Wilson said this is not right, this is unconstitutional, and riding circle with two other, one other Supreme Court justice and a district court judge declared that to be unconstitutional. So a circuit court, 1792 I believe it was, declaring an act of Congress be unconstitutional. So one might argue that the father of judicial review is not John Marshall, but James Wilson. Congress um, very rapidly changed that act and removed judges from this duty, and so that's why it just sort of faded away. Um, let's see. Yeah, well, I will just end with the, um, you might be asking why, why, again, many of you all I know are legal professionals and you would have heard of Wilson. Not many people have. Why not? Well, in part because Americans like winners, and Wilson kind of went out in a negative way, let's put it that way. Wilson was, and again, he was not a perfect man. In all honesty, I think one of his vices was greed. He was always speculating in Westerland, speculating, 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 borrowing money to buy more land, and then bouncing accounts and this sort of thing. Well, eventually, in 1798, there's an economic downturn. Wilson riding circuit was, um, he was unable to pay his creditors, and he was jailed as a sitting Supreme Court justice. He was put in jail um, twice, in effect. I believe in one of these jails, he, um, he, he um, contracted malaria, and he died in South Carolina. And so again, a um, 
sort of it's sad end to a very important uh, jurist. Now, why should we care about Wilson? Why, you know, I don't think he was right about many things. In fact, I've come to like, um, I, I have another book on a guy named Roger Sherman. I've come to like his vision for the American uh, constitutional order far better than Wilson's uh, vision, which is very nationalistic, very powerful executive, this sort of thing. What I think Wilson gives us is these wonderful lectures on law that are very systematic, drawing from the Christian natural law tradition in interesting and creative ways, ways that might be instructive to us today, even if we don't buy everything he has on sale. Thank you very much. Why are two bestsellers now? Well, I don't know if this one is a bestseller, but it ought to be. But thanks, Hadley. Thanks, Holly, for being here. Thanks, Mark, for that interesting presentation um, um, on James Wilson. Uh, I did have the pleasure of co-editing this uh, collection of uh, writings by Justice Scalia. The book is titled Lessons from American on Faith, Lessons from an American Believer. Uh, as the dual meaning of the subtitle indicates, it's in part about Justice Scalia's uh, being a believer in America, including our American tradition of religious freedom, and it's a part about his being a believer in God. The book puts Anton Scalia the man together with Scalia the justice. We learn about Anton Scalia's faith and his thoughts on religious belief, and Justice Scalia's thoughts and rulings on the place of religion in American public life. The book also features a wonderful foreword by Justice Thomas, uh, Justice Scalia's longtime dear friend. Uh, Justice Thomas says in one passage, Nino did not discuss his faith with me often, but his deep faith in God was implicit in everything he did. There's also an introduction by uh, his son, Father Paul Scalia, and actually the funeral homily from Father Paul is included in this work as well. Uh, and uh, Paul says that uh, my father was devout in his own rough and tumble way. And like everything else in his life, faith had something of an argument and contest about it. We also include in the volume, I say we, I, I edited this book with uh, Chris Scalia, the eighth of the nine Scalia children, uh, reflections on Justice Scalia's faith from a variety of folks who knew him, a rabbi, a priest, law clerks, friends, his, 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 his godson, uh, and it closes with a funeral homily. Let me start off by talking about Justice Scalia as a man of faith. For he, indeed, he was a man of faith. I'm not maintaining the family certainly not, does not maintain that he was a saint. Um, he, uh, as Father Paul put it in the funeral homily, he was a practicing Catholic, practicing to, you know, to, to work to get better. Faith was a very uh, important part of his life all along. It mattered uh, deeply to him. It shaped who he was. It challenged him, uh, provoked him. Uh, and uh, you cannot understand um, Anton Scalia, the man, without understanding uh, his faith. Uh, his faith, I think, uh, and, and what, what matters ultimately to him is uh, best reflected in a speech that he um, gave perhaps hundreds of times over the years. Justice Scalia uh, loved to go and talk to people and inspired countless individuals uh, throughout the country. He, uh, many who never met him, as you can tell from the lines of thousands of mourners who waited for hours in cold weather uh, to pay their respects as his body lay in repose at the Supreme Court. He generously shared his faith in many ways, including by accepting speaking invitations from Catholic and Christian groups from around the country. And his favorite speech is one that he called the Two Thomases. I first heard him give it in the early 1990s. Uh, the, the formal uh, name of the speech is the Christianist Cretan, which involves some ironic uh, wordplay, but he would refer to this as the two Thomas. It's largely because this, in this speech, he explores and contrasts the worldviews and religious understandings of two great men named Thomas. The first one he discusses is Thomas Jefferson, who would spend quiet evenings in the White House with a Bible in one hand and a razor blade in the other, excising from the Gospels the passages that, that Jefferson, in his wisdom, deemed to be uh, things impossible, superstitions, fanaticisms, and fabrications. And the Jefferson Bible ends abruptly with the entombment of the crucified body of Jesus in a sepulcher. As Justice Scalia observed, in Jefferson's eyes, everything from Easter morning to the Ascension had to, had to have been made up by those evangelist rogues, presumably part of their clever plan to get themselves crucified. 
<laughs> Justice Scalia's second Thomas, as you might have guessed, is his great hero, St. Thomas More. Along with the wedding picture of his bride, Justice Scalia's official Supreme Court portrait includes on his desk Hans Holbein's uh, depiction of St. Thomas More. There's obviously much that Scalia and More had in common. Both had great legal minds that carried them to the heights of government power. Both were noted for their wit and their capacity for friendship. Both were embroiled in controversy over the nature of marriage and religious liberty. Both were men of faith and of prayer. But to really understand Justice Scalia's special admiration for St. Thomas More, I ask you to indulge me as I read a, a long excerpt from, from his speech. More was, of course, one of the great men of his age, lawyer, scholar, humanist, philosopher, statesman, a towering figure, not just in his own country of England, but throughout Renaissance Europe. You will have missed the deep significance of Moore's martyrdom, and you will not understand why Moore is a, is a particularly apt patron saint for lawyers, scholars, and intellectuals, unless you appreciate that the reason he died was, in the view of almost everyone at the time, a silly one. Many martyrs have died for refusing to deny Jesus Christ, or for spreading his gospel, or for adhering to his clear moral teachings. Moore, on the other hand, went to his death to support the proposition that only the Bishop of Rome could bind or lose the marriage of Henry VIII, a papacy corrupt and politicized, a papacy that often granted or withheld divorce for reasons of diplomacy rather than doctrine. Moore knew all that. Further than what he did, Moore was unsupported by intelligent society, by his friends, even by his own wife. And I just have to know that that, that thought must have particularly stunned uh, Justice Scalia. But, of course, he went on, Moore was seeing it not with the eyes of men, but with the eyes of faith. He believed Christ's word that Peter was the rock, and the Christian tradition that the Pope was head of the church. And as low as the papacy had declined, the vicar of Christ alone had the power to bind and to loose. He, he continues, I find it hard to understand the reasoning of those wise people who revered Thomas More as a saint rather than a world-class fool for dying to support the decision of Pope Clement the Seventh concerning King Henry's divorce of Catherine of Aragon, but who, who themselves ignore and indeed positively oppose the teachings of Pope John Paul II on much more traditional and less politically charged subjects. Go figure. And he concludes the speech with a prayer. For the courage to suffer the contempt of the sophisticated world, for these seeming failings of ours, we lawyers and intellectuals, who do not like to be regarded as unsophisticated, he had no greater model than the great, intellectual, urbane, foolish, childish man that he was. St. Thomas More, pray for us. I had the privilege this summer of um, visiting Thomas More's cell in the Tower of London. Uh, and the, the fellow who helped uh, arrange this and uh, uh, gave us the tour explained that Justice Scalia had, had visited the same cell some years ago. And what's more, had insisted that mass be said in that cell, which I, I think uh, 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 his host found a little difficult for a while, but he insisted and, and, and he, 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 he prevailed. So again, I think you really see uh, in this speech um, what, what, what ultimately mattered um, most to Justice Scalia, and that was uh, his faith and uh, living out a life of faith. There's another speech in this book um, on the title On Being Different, the Christian is Pilgrim, when he talks, of, talks about how if you, if you experience no tension at all between what the world demands of you and what your religion demands of you, um, you know, perhaps you're not taking your religion very seriously. And this is a speech he gave to uh, a group of judges, I believe, in the early 1990s. Now I want to talk a little bit uh, about Justice Scalia's view of judging and, and the role of his, his faith on his judging. He has a uh, speech in here on the vocation of a judge, and I'm going to quote some from this, but I want to emphasize, he's talking about the vocation of a judge. Some people, I think, misunderstand Justice Scalia's view that, 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 that his faith does not, should not, does not influence how he, how he judges, as though he's separating his faith from his profession. No, he's instead insisting that a proper understanding of vocation requires that, that he not indulge his, his Catholic beliefs in carrying out that vocation. So, in this uh, 
talk, he explores just what um, a vocation of a Christian of a Catholic is. And as he, as, as he explains, how one's faith affects the practice of one's vocation depends primarily upon what one's vocation is. No matter how good a Catholic a short order chef may be, for example, there is no such thing as a Catholic hamburger. Unless, of course, there's a perfectly made and perfectly cooked hamburger. He goes on to explain that legislators and presidents have plenty of leeway to pursue in the world of policy their views of what is just and indeed um, and within the bounds of prudence have an obligation to do so. But the work of the judicial branch is fundamentally different from that of the legislative and executive. Unlike presidents, cabinet secretaries, etc., federal judges do not make, make policy, but rather are to discern accurately and apply honestly the policies adopted by the people's representatives in the text of statutes, except to the extent that those statutes conflict with the text, the underlying traditions, or valid Supreme Court interpretation of the United States Constitution. Just as there is no Catholic way to cook a hamburger, so also there is no Catholic way to interpret a text, analyze a historical tr tradition, or discern the meaning and legitimacy of prior <coughs> judicial decisions, except, of course, to strive to do those things honestly and perfectly. Now, Justice Scalia was often uh, accused by his critics of indulging um, his faith, and indeed he was sometimes faulted by his friends um, for not doing so. Uh, I think the, um, the, the criticism from the left is manifestly unsound, if you look at issue after issue after issue, very important fundamental issues, you know, whether it's abortion or marriage or the death penalty. Justice Scalia's view was not that the Constitution imposed or entrenched the Catholic position on those issues, but rather that left those matters to the democratic processes, to the people in the states, to decide one way or another, to revisit over time. It's the opposite of a, a, a theocrat, I would think, from someone who, who respects the democratic processes, even though, of course, he knew that, that, that in many instances uh, the, 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 the public would not adopt policies that, that he himself would favor. Uh, but on, on matter after matter, his understanding of the Constitution, based on his, his methodology of originalism, is that the Constitution left these matters to the democratic processes uh, for decision. And uh, the speech that I um, just quoted from on the vocation of a judge was one that he gave to a, a Catholic group in, in uh, Long Island that, that he thought that he was worried was, was, was praising him for his abortion decisions. And he says to them, look, if, you, if, you, if you're praising me for being a pro-life justice, um, you're misunderstanding me. I am anti-Roe. I believe that Roe is sound, unfaithful to what the Constitution means. But if there were a valid... Uh, if there were a democratic enactment in the state allowing abortion, I would understand my duty uh, to be to, to permit that to go into, into effect. Now, if there's a debate, um, I know, um, I think I, one of the authors of one side of the debate here, one of our guests, I don't know whether or not that's a sound interpretation of the, of the Constitution. I you know, believe it is, though I readily um, uh, would grant that the view that the Constitution um, uh, Set forth a right to life is far more coherent and compelling than the position taken in Roe. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, I think a much, much more um, persuasive argument. Now, did Justice Scalia's faith lead him to embrace originalism? That I, I think, and in, in, in short, is the argument that uh, Professor Thomas Berg makes in the book that um, Mark has, has has put together. I think Justice Scalia would answer that question by saying, what? <laughs> uh, look, he, he would say, the, the one principle of my faith that binds me as a judge is, is thou shalt not lie. And in his understanding of, 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 of the Constitution and of, of uh, legal interpretation, uh, originalism uh, is the, the methodology that's required uh, in order to not be lying about what the Constitution means. So, uh, he would say, 
I don't have to justify, um, I don't have to explain when they have psychologized why I am an originalist. It's those who, who depart from it who have the, the, the burden of, of, of justifying what they're doing. So I think you would, uh, you might say, yes, insofar as I am committed not to lie about what the Constitution means, that I'm an originalist insofar as my faith leads me to that conviction not to lie, uh, yes, that follows, but not in any, uh, in any other way. So with that, I think I'll uh, uh, have a seat and open things up to further discussion. Thank you. Uh, this brings back, somebody brings back memories of Nino, and uh, I think for us of um, personal reflection. Um, when my, my wife died suddenly five years ago, we were having a memorial mass at the uh, Chapel's County Information Center. I was in the front row, and there's no Nina, and Nina was behind me. And he saw the situation, and he took his cushion, and he slipped it under, under my knees. And they had thought they were looking out, so there he was. He was looking out for you as he was looking out for all of us. I'm surprised he noticed. Remember, he, he told me one night at dinner that uh, he was approached by a reporter and said, Mr. Justice, we know you We know you love children. He said, whoa, why don't you get that? So we have nine of them. He said, that means I love my wife. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I was just, a friend of mine was, um, has been going through history, tra tracking her family, she was, uh, um, she came across these, these remarkable documents say, from religion and the law from Newton, Massachusetts in 1670, where the policy is we don't allow anyone to be a freeman living in this community who is not available for communion, who cannot take communion. It's not the way we do it now, but we understand what's, what's lying behind this, that we we take seriously the notion that the laws will shape the moral character of the community. And before we give you, trust you, the sharing power over us, our lives, we want to look closely at, at what your situation is. Now, they took seriously that notion and, of shaping the moral character. Um, to our hand, this Nino would insist that uh, we're not governed by these Shavian. Um, John Stewart Bill test from the Kiro Park. Uh, the people of Indiana can pass this law to bar uh, new displays simply pro bonus morris, uh, the good morris. That's part of the reason. But at the same time, he never, you know, I thought that his mission of the law, I think, was to shape you know, the souls of the moral character. What do you, what do you make of, of uh, you know, that? Well, I think. He would say that it's not his mission to decide what the broader mission of the law is. So I think as an individual, uh, he would support policies that, as a voter, as a citizen, that um, foster community well-being, promote sound morals. Uh, so there's a speech he gives the book that seems to take a much more minimalist view of government. I, 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 I acknowledge that. And I, I, I have some, um, I'm not sure how much I actually agree with that, 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 that particular speech. Um, but look, I, I think he would um, say that the First Amendment, properly understood, uh, allows uh, substantial restrictions on not just you know, obscenity narrowly defined, but you know, pornography, and would be aghast uh, at uh, prevalence in our culture, and we understand the damage it does to the moral imagination of, of you know, young men, uh, especially. Uh, so I, um, I, I'm not sure I really accept his account in this one speech, yeah. where he, he no. seems to say that the government should not concern itself at all um, with, with, with um, anything other than material welfare, I, I, I think, if I'm, if I'm uh, being faithful to, to, to the speech. Um, so, but, but again, he would say that it's not his mission as a justice to determine what the mission of the law is. That's for others to determine. As a justice, he's simply determining um, what laws mean, 
are they class are they constitutional? And I, I perhaps could have mentioned my own name. Um, so he's often criticized by some as a positivist, and certainly in terms of uh, what he understood his role as a, as a justice to be. Yes, he was looking to text positively enacted to determine what they what they meant. That doesn't mean that he did not believe in the existence of natural law. But I think he may have been more uh, skeptical than some others of the, the, the capacity of flawed human beings to um, discern what natural law um, commands. Uh, I think he would have been especially scared of what um, some of his colleagues on the court would do if they um, thought they had the license to indulge natural law. Of course, they do the same thing under you know under uh, other rubrics. So I'm not I'm not sure the risk would be any greater. But uh, again, his, his, his broader point would be that uh, his role as a justice is not to deliver justice, but rather to rule on, the, on what the law means and decide in particular cases. Yeah, I used to say, for somebody who is so often skeptical of natural law, he gave us handsome examples on how it might be done, even though he was skeptical about it. Everyone's, he leaned it to uh, Kennedy after the Rapanos case. He'd do something like this and he'd say, Yes, but that which is like navigable waters is not itself navigable waters. I said, Yeah, good days work, you know, a little bit of propositional logic, and you. But the one that was really appealing was the one um, after the break case from Colorado, um, um, striking down the decision of the Attorney General to. Um, Bar certain controlled substances can be struck down. And Nino invoked um, the Hippocratic Oath. We know that there is a purpose for medicine. It is to preserve life, not destroy life. And the same purpose of, of, of the medical profession. And Kennedy said, yeah, that's one interesting view. And Nino just like exploded. He went up like a minute and three. One, one interesting view. It is the only natural interpretation, he said. I said, oh, natural, you mean sit like this, a natural reflex? Because Janet Dino had a different reflex. So I must have been trying to reason with something. Uh, so you know, the one of the interesting questions was when acting pro bono stomachs, they say, when you're acting to, to bar pornography and bar them, and these other decisions on vices, bar prostitutions. You think there are moral truths underlying that position? And the moral truths that underlie the laws. He was he was sheepish about that. And at some point I thought he thought he didn't wasn't sure that natural law he really had objective truths to yield, that he really more like believed in them as a Catholic rather than conceding that natural law would have truths to yield. Hmm. In that particular example, I would think his answer would be that as a justice, he would recognize that it's permissible for others to believe that there's this foundation and, and to act on that. Right. But and so he, he need not speak for himself there. But still, if he wants to sustain those laws, you say, those, he was strictly personal freedom. And he wrote with real conviction about them to sustain, uh, to sustain those laws. And then he'd say, remember his speech in Cambridge, he said, well, natural law has different views of natural law. But then he finds that there are different views of natural of, of ritualism. People have to know. But the fact that we differ in our views of naturalism doesn't displace natural uh, originalism. We said, ah, some people may have it right, others wrong, and we can just reason about the matter. Let me, let me just turn to, 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 to Wilson. Wilson certainly agreed with Immanuel Kant, you'd say, on this, what they both took to be the first principle of moral legal judgment, which is it makes no sense to cast judgments of praise and blame when people have no active powers to cause their own acts to happen. So we hold that uh, we don't hold people blameworthy for acts they were powerless to affect. That's very precise, very concrete, nothing foggy about it. It's not in the text of the Constitution. We regard it as a first principle. He said, well, are you really are you really sure that Wilson regarded natural law as something so hovering in the sky that it doesn't come into play? But you, you wrote on religion. What is your sense, Frank, right, of, of Wilson on, on religion, on religious freedom? Sure. Uh, 
Peter. He doesn't um, say a whole lot about it. He clearly praises Locke's letter on toleration and the founding of Maryland as a haven for Catholics. It's, I think it's fair to infer that he has a pretty robust understanding of religious liberty as, as something that should protect all Americans and not just Protestant Americans. Okay. So, we could be much really open to for our questions from, uh, from our guests. So we're, we're open. Yes, but would you identify yourself? Do we have a microphone for him? Oh, okay. Believe me, boys. Hey, can you hear your voice around somewhere? It's okay. Seriously? Hello, uh, my name is Mark. I am a student. Uh, Mark uh, McKibben. I'm an undergraduate student at George Washington University, and James Wilson was a relative of the family, um, uh, Ed William Wilson's brother is an ancestor. Wow. And I wanted to just ask about um, originalism, because I'll be honest with you, one of the I guess, issues I take with originalism is that how, in a sense, are we supposed to determine what the intent of the founders is? Because obviously, at the Constitutional Convention, there were a lot of very divisive votes about what the amendments to the Constitution would be, um, what would be the in the articles, and so, and obviously not every founder got what they want on every issue, and I mean even James Wilson, as, as Professor Hall pointed out, wanted a direct popular vote of the president, and it ended up the Electoral College ended up being his alternative. So how can we determine the intent of the founders when the founders so sharply disagreed on? what they believed, and, and does that make that the best philosophy for jurisprudence? Well, the dominant form of originalism these days is not an originalism that looks to original intent, but it's rather one of original public meaning. And of course, these disagreements ended up being resolved in the form of language that was adopted. So no one thinks that, you know, that, that Wilson's view of direct election of presidents is a plausible account of, of, of the Constitution. Um, I think the easiest way, um, perhaps, for me to answer your question is to briefly explain what originalism is and then give an example. So, uh, in part, I find even uh, law professors often misstate what originalism is. Originalism basically is a proposition that provisions of the Constitution, including amendments, are to be interpreted uh, according to the meaning, this is the public meaning version, to the meaning that they bore at the time they were adopted. And the same uh, principle of originalism applies to statutes enacted today, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And I think we really see it in, in, inherent in what law is. And I'll use one example. This is an example that I used years ago, and I thought I was so far removed from political controversy that no one's political biases could possibly influence uh, how uh, the matter was viewed. And this is the provision of the Constitution that in order to be eligible to be president, one must be a natural born citizen. Natural born citizen. What does that term mean? Uh, now, you might, you know, folks might look to contemporary meaning and think uh, natural born, that sounds sort of like natural childbirth. So maybe only if you were born uh, through natural childbirth would you be eligible to be president. Uh, obviously, a ludicrous um, example. Um, what's been interesting is, in all the controversies over Ted Cruz or um, John McCain, was actually a really interesting issue, uh, uh, virtually everyone has understood that the relevant question is to, is to look and see what this term meant when it was adopted. Now, now there are disputes um, as to just what it meant. And so I, I will readily concede that originalism uh, is not going to answer every question, and then you get into secondary questions of well, what do you do when things are unclear, and this is where you can have some, some conflicts between the, those of us who advocate judicial restraint, that is, if the Constitution doesn't speak clearly to the matter, you have to let the Democratic enactment op, uh, operate, uh, as opposed to some of our libertarian friends who are um, more ready to, to uh, say that the um, only very low bar has to be met before you um, can, can, can strike something down. Um, but uh, I, I guess just to say, what's the alternative um, to, to originalism? So again, there are not clear answers in some cases. But frankly, in all the in in all the hot button issues of the last you know a few decades, all or nearly all, 
uh, certainly when it comes to uh, the, the abortion and death penalty and marriage, uh, originalism makes this pretty darn easy. Michael Bushbacher. Um, that brings up to me an interesting question about the original public meaning of the judicial power. If, as uh, Professor Paul very interestingly noted, the uh, original members of the Supreme Court, and presumably many of their contemporaries, believed that the judicial power included a natural law component for analyzing the effects of a statute or other uh, action of the government, and believed that judges had a duty to strike down things that went at least seriously contrary to the natural law. Uh, doesn't that pose a problem for a text-based uh, originalism that focuses solely on what the words meant or did not mean? Well, an interesting question. I'd say, first of all, originalism is not um, purely text-based. Um, it, um, it's not confined to this, let's look at these letters and study them. i say more broadly uh, um, that when we look to, say, Federal 78 and Hamilton's um, explication, of the power of judicial review, uh, which talks about um, uh, basically putting two laws side by side and determining that there's an irreconcilable variance between them, and only then can you strike down, uh, not or rather not, not apply the, um, the, the, the statute. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested, and I hadn't been aware of um, the, the evidence of what some of the early um, justices thought. Um, uh, I might suggest that indicates that the uh, uh, Temptation to in, to in, uh, expand judicial power uh, has been with us from the beginning. Right. <laughs> that, that, that may well be, um, but um, you know. I, there, but that said, there could be lots of interesting questions about just what the scope of the judicial power is. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Originalism just makes certain kind of common sense. You want to apply this, the, the document as it was understood by the people of Frank and the people who ratified, who voted for it. And of course, there'll be differences, there'll be different judgments. And you deal with, you deal with any difference, you just have to reason, reason about it. But at a certain point, you, you are moved beyond the text, as he was a number of times. I remember after the decision of the Second Amendment, we were talking, and I said, I know you appealed in the, um, was it the Heller case? The first one was Heller. Right? Was in Heller, you appealed to a deep principle of self preservation. Which I, I took you to mean the right of an innocent person to fend off an unjustified assault. Yeah, absolutely right. That's right. So of course, those words are not exactly in the Second Amendment. So I was wondering, are, we, are, are you invoking it because Wilson and Blackstone both mention it, and a lot of people read them at the time? Or are you appealing to a deep principle of the right of an innocent person to defend himself that may not depend on that, those words being exactly in the text? He said, I'll, I'll think about it. And of course, we have that, that famous problem with um, the 14th Amendment. Well, I'm in trouble to shoot his colleagues up and down. And nothing in that 14th Amendment was going to bar those laws in Illinois, those laws in Virginia that barred marriage across racial lines. And I said, Do you think maybe you made a mistake in taking up Logan versus Virginia? He said, I don't know. You have to think about it. But with, no, there's no way they can undo it. But here is, what's up, for example, Think, look at a disability based on religion. You know, uh, remember they had this old press case on the youngster who was deaf. He had access under the laws of, New of Arizona and the federal government to an interpreter. But he lost it as soon as he went to a Catholic school. They weren't struck that knock that one down. And, and we don't, it, you know, what is it? It's, it, it, it didn't interfere with his freedom of religion. The fact is, it's still free to pray. It wasn't a disability based on, on, on office. But Nino came around to that position very strongly in remember of Josh Davey, barred from that scholarship in Washington. Nino came down very strongly on that. Uh, Bill Rehnquist was willing to hold it under federalism in Washington. They, Washington had decided that, that uh, they, could with, they could give aid to religion or they could withhold it. But Nino thought this was a disability that came to bear on him solely because of, of his and now the court has, has come over to that side. So I just said, I think, I, you know, I think Nino was persistently moving beyond the text as he had to try to work through these things, even starting with the text. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Harvey Bauma. Uh, 
I remember a number of years ago, I heard uh, or read about uh, Russian President Putin making a comment about the American notion that you can't discriminate on the basis of religion. He was kind of ridiculing it. He said, that's ridiculous. Of course you should discriminate against uh, Satanists. I thought, well, that kind of had a point there. I didn't agree with them too often, but he seemed to have a, you know, it seemed to be common sense. And I'm wondering, have we reached the point in our country where governments cannot dis discriminate against Satanists? And could you sketch out some legal theory that would um, permit governments to so discriminate? For example, denying Satanists from being able to have a chaplain in the armed forces. Well, apparently, the law now is still going to believe that the, the Religious freedom does not mean the right to practice so keen to burn wives on funeral pyres or anything like that. We have a sense those those laws are necessary to good order. And we used to think that uh, the, the affirmation of radical evil would certainly be uh, run counter to the understanding of the God of the Declaration of Independence, the author of the nature's laws and, and the moral laws. But just we're moving into a period in which some of our friends, I think, are making a tactical move where they think, well, we'll I'll accept, we'll accept some Satanists running the law around here for this, and, and for the sake of give, providing broader protection. And my concern is once you adopt the relativist position, then you remove the ground in which you claim religion itself is a good. I can explain why it is we're justified in taking measures to do part of it. And they have yeah, I, I don't think it's a tactical move. I think it's a definitional problem. How do you define what is or is not a religion? Uh, the, the, the Supreme Court has never um, addressed that in a comprehensive way. And I think it's a really difficult question. I think the Supreme Court has avoided having to address that by being very deferential to assertions of religious belief. Um, but it's just that, that, um, that, I mean, that they'd be sincere, though again, there's deference uh, on, on that question. But you know, a, a peaceful Satanist, rather than someone who's looking to, uh, you know, uh, engage in human sacrifice, I, I think that poses real difficulties um, for um, the, uh, the justices, uh, for all of them to try, to try to find what is religion and what's not. You actually have an asymmetry uh, in the two religion clauses, or the two parts of one religion clause, if you prefer, uh, in that. Uh, Secularism um, has uh, been deemed to be a religion for purposes of free exercise, but not for the Establishment Clause. So you can go ahead and establish secularism as, uh, and all sorts of other things, and you're not going to uh, face a uh, Establishment Clause challenge. If I could weigh on this briefly, I think, and this kind of ties in nicely with the um, founding generation in Scalia, I think an originalist understanding of the religion clause or clauses for would permit the government to discriminate, um, to even favor Christianity or favor Protestantism. But I think as originalists, we have to say, okay, America is very different today than it was in the late 18th century. The late 18th century, about 98% of white Americans are Protestant. The other 2% are Roman Catholic. You have about 2,500 Jews in four American cities. You know, today, of course, the number of Christians are maybe 75%, and we have all sorts of non-Christian minorities. And so I think it's entirely appropriate. For instance, prior to World War I, in national cemeteries, you could either have a headstone with nothing on it or a cross. After World War I, they included, okay, you can have a cross, nothing, or a Star of David. And today, the US military allows something like 89 religious symbols. Including Wiccan, right? Including Wiccan. I believe there's six to eight uh, Wiccan markers in Arlington National Cemetery. And these things were brought about through the, um, I would like to think largely the democratic process, and they're very appropriate things. I, I, I think prudence suggests that we should accommodate non-religious um, people or religious minorities whenever we possibly can. Now, there's still are lines to be drawn, but we have good tests to do that. If, a, if someone wants to do something in the name of religion that is uh, violating someone else's right, if the state has a compelling interest to step in and stop it, you know, we can obviously stop some actions based on religion. But otherwise, I think it's wonderful that we accommodate and. Um, Respect a, a wide range of faiths. Fair enough. I'm, I just would raise the Father Shaw question. See, my is here. Father Shaw would always say, "The what is question? What is the table?" 
what is religion? The court in the conscience objection case has moved away to the point of saying that he is animated by a passion in his life that may be the place of religion and belief in God. Say, so, okay, let's let's remove this along. You remove God and you simply reduce things to that which people are passionate about. And my pitch is by the time you've taken that path, you've taken a path that, well, as Stan Evans used to say, the problem with pragmatism is that it doesn't work. <laughs> One more question. Hi, I'm Jenny Green from the Church Foundation. I wanted to ask you about Scalia's article in the Law Journal on Chevron deference. Um, towards the end, you will see the Chevron deference oh, yeah. the Duke Law Journal. Uh, so when I was reading it, towards the end, he seems to suggest that we shouldn't get rid of the Chevron doctrine because we might need it in the future, which to me sounds like he kind of advocates for different circumstances where there just might have to be an activist versus exercising the judicial authority to. But he's not really clear about. Uh, well, on Chevron deference, uh, this is a uh, this this speech as well as the speech he gave twenty years later on uh, Chevron is actually included in that third volume of Justice Scalia's works that um, is in the process right now, focused on law. Uh, let me be brief here because I think this is probably uh, not too connected to um, um, faith matters. Um, Justice Scalia understood Chevron as a default rule of construction against which Congress could legislate. He did not uh, understand it to be some sort of constitutional mandate. Chevron deference, I should highlight for those of you non-lawyers, is the principle that um, an agency uh, is entitled to uh, implement a reasonable uh, Interpretation of the statute that, 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 um, that's governing it doesn't necessarily have to be the right one, and, and um, the courts will defer to a reasonable um, interpretation, even if it's not the best one. Uh, so, look, I think Justice Scalia in that speech was, was, was um, offering people out there different arguments for why they um, ought to defend Chevron. I don't think that, that the, the notion, I don't, I don't think that particular passage you read conveys. His conviction about the, the best argument for it. So uh, we have about time to wrap it up. Okay, the, um, we call Jefferson, and Jefferson, Jefferson said he hoped every young man then alive would die a Unitarian. And I think of Mark Russell's old line about the Unitarians who move into the southern town in the middle of the night, the bigots come and burn a large question. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I'd like to thank my buddies for coming along with us today and to celebrate also some two fine books. And we're going to have a little signing afterwards, right? Yeah? The books are going to be available downstairs. Yes, sir. And Mike, you want to close this off? Yeah. Thank you, Ed. Well, thank you all for coming on a rainy night. You had many choices for your investment of time. I think this is a good one. Uh, as you can see, the James Wilson Institute, which is about eight years old, and the Arcus started it um, several years ago, um, gathers not only very thoughtful speakers, but you. And to continue to make that uh, possible, like all nonprofits, we would like and honored to have your support. Uh, we really do three things. We do public programs like this. In the summer, every summer in the first week of August, we have our fellows program. We find 15 attorneys who are young and typically involved either in the Justice Department or a clerk or an appellate judge or teaching uh, who wants to spend a week with Professor Arcus and other scholars like these two gentlemen and others. Uh, we take them through a whole curriculum for a week in Washington, D.C. It's called our Fellows Program. We now have had 87 go through that program over the years. And then finally, uh, we do um, for uh, appellate judges, appellate lawyers, scholars, and Others, um, programs at law schools. This past year, we've been to Harvard, Yale, and University of Chicago. Last year, BYU and other law schools. And then twice a year, we assemble uh, judges for weekends, sort of like Liberty Fund weekends. We just had one last weekend, uh, where we talk with the judges, uh, scholars, and, and attorneys.
opportunities again about questions of law either in the past that we can learn from or that are currently before the Supreme Court or other courts so that we can uh, learn uh, from the depths of the natural rights, the natural law philosophy. We did have our rights before. We had our constitution that our founders saw to be good in all people. And we got this from Cicero and Locke and, and Montesquieu and others. And we want to continue that tradition at the James Wilson Institute. We all have this top secret card right here. And if you'd be so kind as to think about filling this out and becoming a member, we'd be honored to have you. And you can also go on the website to do that. Now we're going to break downstairs. We have drinks. Both authors, I think, are going to. Okay. Okay. But first, I'd like to say, congratulations. Oh, yeah. Celebrate the. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Right.